So, um, my name is Helena Moreira. I'm a researcher in the uh, Universidade Católica Portuguesa in Portugal, and I work with bioinocula uh, in uh, phytoremediation uh, or in sustainable agriculture, uh, in phytomanagement as well. So, today I'm presenting uh, two studies of phytomanagement of metalloids uh, contaminated soils. I'm going to give you an overview of what is uh, phytotechnologies, what is phytomanagement, what is metalloids, uh, the contaminated soils, and what are the problems that we have in producing bioinocula in, uh, in the lab, and the problems that we have when you are going to a contaminated site and we have to, to see the pollution, to see what kind of plants are going to, to produce, what kind of bioinocula is the most suitable. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about of these things. You are welcome to make questions whenever you want. I can stop the presentation and answer. Of course, you, can, uh, you are most welcome to do that. I'm sorry. So soil pollution uh, is, um, is a, a problematic issue worldwide because soil is a non-renewable resource and uh, the, its pollution impacts not only the ecosystems but also the human health. And the pollution of soil is impacted by agriculture's practices due to the overuse of fertilizers and pesticides, waste disposal, commercial activities, transport spills, and of course, the industrial and mining activities. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry, it's <laughs> my mobile phone. And the, the, um, the soils are polluted either by organic and inorganic uh, substances. I work mainly with trace elements, metals and metalloids, but we can find in soils a mixture of organic and inorganic pollutants. Uh, not only we find the soils uh, with metalloids and non-metal substances, but also with PCBs, with benzene, with dioxines, a lot of substance we can find in the, in the soil. And why should we think in, re in remediating the soil? Why should we, should we think in recovering soil? Because soil has several uh, functions. Soils deliver ecosystem services that enable life on earth. Uh, uh, for instance, carbon sequestration, provision of food, fiber and fuel, uh, climate regulation, nutrient cycling. So it's very important the functions that soil performs to human kind. So the, this, this is better uh, if we use the, the, the sustainable technologies to recover soil pollution. And this has been a research, uh, um, an issue in research all over the world. And it has been also um, um, an interest by policy makers to, to make legislation to uh, uh, face this uh, problematic issue. So why we should use phytotechnologies and what are phytotechnologies? Phytotechnologies are the use of plants and associated microorganisms to extract, degrade, contain or immobilize pollutants and can be uh, performed in soil, not only in soil, but also in groundwater, sediments and other contaminated media. And how we can do that? We can use phytoextraction and phytostabilization. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a while. And why it's better than the civil engineer techniques? Because it's less invasive, it's cost effective, improves soil health and functions, and prevents erosion and pollutants leaching. And the technologies that, that I was talking about uh, that are mainly, mainly suitable to trace elements are phytostabilization, where trace elements are stabilized in the roots of the plants or in the soil through precipitation or onto absorption in the roots or inside the roots or by phytoextraction, where the pollutants are taken up by the plants and the plants take up to the harvestable, harvestable parts. So they translocate the metals from the roots to the shoots. 
and the amount of trace elements is decreasing uh, uh, with the time in the soil. In the last few years, uh, a new concept uh, arose, which is phytomanagement. And phytomanagement aligns the environment and the economy. And the stakeholders, the site owners, can benefit for, from environmental revenues, which are the increase of biodiversity, the protection of the soil, the carbon sequestration, and other environmental benefits that I was talking about but also from uh, economic revenues because they can use those soils to produce biomass and that biomass can be used for the production of timber to be used as feedstock for pulp and paper adhesives etc can be used to grow some bioenergy crops to produce biodiesel bioethanol so they can be used for several things and stakeholders can get some money from those contaminated sites. Those, those sites can also be used for phytomining, which is the extraction of valuable metals such as nickel from the plants, and can be used also to produce some fortified crops, which is enriched with the trace elements, trace elements such as selenium or zinc. But what we have to consider in phytomanagement, we have to consider a lot of stuff. The plants are not only the players. We have, besides the plant, the cropping system, which is the organization of the plants, the cropping patterns, which amendments should we add to, to, to the plant's drive? And what bioinocula could we use to promote plant growth and resistance and resilience to the trace elements present in the soil? So what criteria should plants fit? So they should be easy to grow and harvest. They should yield high biomass shade. They should be, of course, pollutant tolerant, and they should be fast growth rate. And we have several plants within this con these concepts, such hemp, such maize, such sunflower, tobacco, miscanthos, and several trees like, po like poplar, willow. So there are several types of plants that we can use. Cropping systems, what are the cropping systems? So we have to consider the climate conditions of the site. The, so the crops have to be tolerant to that to climate conditions. We have to think if we want annual crops, perennial crops, if we want to put some cover crops to stabilize the soil, to decrease the soil erosion and decrease the trace element leaching. We should design and monitor all the things that we do in the field. The sequence of the crops have to be thought. So the cropping patterns, all the management stuff. So we have to think in a lot of things when we are thinking in the fighter management of a trace element contaminated soil. Sometimes we have to use amendments to recover the soil because the plants cannot grow without these amendments. Sometimes it's possible, sometimes we, don't, we cannot do it without these amendments. And there are several types of amendments. There we have the manures, the biochar, compost, green residues, biosolids. It always depends on what we want, what, what we have available. So it depends on many factors. But there are a lot of choices that we can make. And then we have the bioalimentation, which is uh, the use of bioinocula, the use of bacteria, the use of fungi that can help plant thrive in those harsh areas and can help also the mobilization or immobilization of the trace elements in the soil. And in bacteria, we can inoculate one strain, we can inoculate several strains, the same with the fungi, single strain, a consortium of fungi, or a composite uh, bioinocula uh, with bacteria and the fungi. And what kind of this uh, microorganisms uh, service provides? So the bacteria, we usually use the, the plant growth promoting bacteria. There are several types of plant growth promoting bacteria and they can help plants with growth promotion. They produce growth hormones like auxins, gibberellins, cytokinins. They release stress reducing enzymes and they induce the systemic resistance of the plant. And they also help the plants to acquire some nutrients like uh, phosphorus and um, uh, potassium. 
they help plants, uh, plants to fixate nitrogen, and they, they also release cytophores that are mo molecules that collate iron and then they give to the plant. And they ha also have the biocide production, which uh, prevents the spread of diseases of, uh, to the plants. And we can have also fungi, and within the fungi, we have the mycorrhizal fungi that associate intimately with the, the roots of the plants. And uh, uh, it reduces also the plant stress, improves the water and nutrient acquisition by plants, and promotes the plant growth. And besides that, in the soil, in decreased soil organic matter, it reduces erosion and reduces stress element lixiviation. So together, they will improve the phytomanagement and the efficiency. That's what we want. But for this inoculus selection and production, we have a stepwise process that begins in the isolation and characterization of bacteria in this case, but we have also the isolation and characterization of the fungi as well. They have to be, of course, non-pathogenic, both for plants and for humans. They have to be easy to produce, adapt to the several types of environment conditions because when, it, when you're going to inoculate it in the field, they are going to, to face uh, sometimes very low pH, low nutrient content. So they have to face uh, very harsh conditions. And we have then to describe their mechanisms of actions, their traits, why they are important if they produce uh, high levels of uh, uh, growth hormones. If they have, they produce ACCDMNAs, it's, um, that reduces the ethylene levels, which is a stress hormone. So we have to describe very well this bacteria. And then we go to the greenhouse and make some combinations between the bacteria or between, between the bacteria and the fungi. And we test in different soils because they can act and be effective in a specific soil. And when we go to the other soil, they don't work at all. We have to test it with different hybrids and cultivars of the, the plants. And we have also to, to think in the number of cells that we are going to inoculate. But a little bit, bit amount of cells may not have the efficiency that we want. So we have to see the, which inoculus size is the best for that kind of soil and that plant. And then we go to the field trials where the plants and the bacteria or the fungi, our inocula, have to face several types of edaphoclimatic conditions, trace elements, not only one, but sometimes a multi-contaminated area is, a, is, a, is available and the, the bacteria have to thrive there. And sometimes they have to face drought and salt stress, several abiotic and biotic stress they have to face. So we start with the greenhouse studies, as I told you, and most of the times the inocula experiments to see whether uh, as in, uh, inocula is effective as, or not, we test it in the sterile soil. Because in a sterile soil, we don't have the native microbi microbial populations. And without the native microbial populations, we only see the efficiency of bacteria. But the things can be very different when we have the, the native microbial um, uh, populations. And that's what we wanted to know, to see in this, uh, in this uh, lab study. So we picked up sterile soil and we compare with non-sterile soil. So inoculative bacteria in sterile soil and in non-sterile soil, and we compared between both. Also, a thing that is very common is to spike the soil with one type of trace element. And this is also very different from what we face in the field because the, the field are naturally contaminated, the, the sorption to the soil particles is different. Uh, the, the maturation is different of the trace elements in the soil. Uh, normally in the soil, we don't found, find only one, but several types of trace elements. 
So the conditions are very different. So we wanted to test if our inocula were really effective under our sterile um, conditions, but were also effective under non-sterile conditions. And for that, we spiked ster uh, sterile soil and we picked up field contaminated soil and we make it uh, the sterilization as well to see if the performance was the same, if there was some consistency between the results, or we have some overestimation of our bacteria in sterile, in sterile conditions. So we want to test, test the efficiency of the two plant growth promoting rhizobacteria to promote the growth, in this case, zinc accumulation in maize plants in spiked and sterilized conditions, and we wanted to compare with field contaminated under sterilized and non-sterilized conditions. We wanted to evaluate the transferability of the results and determine whether the soil conditions affect the performance of bioinocula. So we picked up two PGPR, a Cupriavidus nacator and a Crisium bacteria umi. We uh, uh, make, made the, the traits available. So we search for EIA production, HCN, ACCD aminase activity, ammonia and siderophores. We have already tested these bacteria in other conditions and we saw that they were able to increase the growth and nutrient uptake in maize grown in non-contaminated soil for agriculture's purposes and in, in soil contaminated with cadmium. These two PGPR, I'm sorry again, were retrieved from Estereja Creek, which is a, a chemical complex here in Portugal and was retrieved from the sediments with trace of the lab. So we made two experiments. The experiment one, we picked up uh, some agricultural soil, was sterilized, and we spiked with chloride zinc to achieve the final concentrations uh, of 100, 500, and 1,000 ppm of zinc. Then we inoculated the both bacteria in maize, and we determined biomass, the zinc content, and zinc bioavailability. In experiment two, we uh, retrieved the soil from the industrial uh, complex, uh, chemical complex of Estereja. We sterilized the soil and uh, we, pick, uh, we put some non-sterilized soil as well to perform the same experiment. And the soil has more or less 600 ppm of zinc. And here we inoculated B1, B2, and a mixture of both bacteria. And we determined the same parameters, which were biomass, zinc contain, a zinc content, and zinc bioavailability. Regarding the experiment one, what we saw is what we expected. There was a decrease of root biomass with increasing zinc concentration, but PGPR were uh, able to increase root biomass. And the Crisium uh, bacterium umi was a little bit better of, um, comparing with uh, the Cupriavidus nacator which was the B1. Regarding shoot, there was a slight decrease of shoot biomass with increasing zinc concentration, and the PGPR was, were, were able to generally increase the shoot biomass. And, but were, the, the performance was similar between Crisium bacterium umi e cupriavidus nacator. Regarding zinc accumulation, there was an increase of root and shoot accumulation with increasing zinc concentration. This, uh, is, this was expected as well. PGPR was able to increase zinc accumulation in roots at 100 ppm. And generally, PGPR increased zinc accumul shoot accumulation, especially the bacteria B2. Regarding the, some criteria, some indicators that we have to, to see if the, 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 the phytoremediation is being uh, well done or not, we have the bioconcentration factor, which is the ability for plants for elemental accumulation from the substrate. And we can have the elements concentrating more in root or in shoot. In this case, we have the bioconcentration factor above one in root and below one in shoot. And we saw that factory inoculation could even increase the PCF values in roots. And Crisium bacteria umi increased the bioconcentration factor in shoots in all zinc spiked soils. 
Regarding the translocation factor is another indicator and tell us the plant's potential for elemental translocation from roots to shoots. And this was below one, which means that the metals were, were the metal were concentrating more in roots than in shoots, and there was no effect of bacteria inoculation. What we saw uh, also regarding the bio uh, the zinc bioavailability in soil is that the the zinc bioavailability increased with increased zinc concentration in soil, and bacteria had no effect. Regarding the experiment two that we were re retrieved the natural contaminated soil, we saw that there was lower shoot biomass and non-sterile conditions. And the inoculation with the, the bacteria increased biomass, especially under sterile conditions. Regarding the zinc accumulation, there was a higher zinc accumulation in non-sterile soils, which were related with the lower biomass. And there was an increased root zinc accumulation in non-sterile soils for plants inoculated with the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. And there was no uh, observable effect or a negative effect of PGPR inoculation in shoot tissues in both soils elements. Regarding the bioconcentration factors, the, the in sterile condi conditions were below one, either in, both in shoots and roots, but the metals were again more concentrates in roots. And bioinocular did not significantly affect BCF in roots in this case, and generally decreased the BCF in shoots. In non-sterile conditions, there was a, a bioconcentration factor above one in roots and below one in shoots. And bioinocular were able to increase BCF values in roots and decreased in shoots. Regarding translocation factor in sterile, and non-sterile soils were below one. There was no effect of bacterial uh, uh, inoculation. Regarding zinc bioavailability, the extractable zinc was lower in sterile soils and higher in non-steriles. And bacterial inoculation decreased extractable zinc in sterile conditions and increased in, uh, in, uh, in non-sterile conditions. So what we see is the PGPR inoculation improved maize biomass in zinc spiked soils as well in film contaminated soil, but sterilization strengths this effect. So we had higher biomass in spiked soils and for field contaminated, the sterilization uh, still have uh, an outcome of higher biomass than in non-sterile conditions. But bioinocular induced different zinc accumulation pa uh, patterns in spiked and field contaminated soils. And what we saw also was that sterilization reduced zinc bioavailability and affect the plant accumulation patterns. Maybe it was because of the extraction of soil aggregates that increased the clay's fraction uh, and the increasing say, uh, soil clays fraction, there was new reaction, reaction sites to increase metal absorption. But it, it is a, a supposing, we don't know for sure, we had to test it, this hypothesis. So what conclusion do we uh, get? The bioinocular maintained the positive effects, but the sterilization effect bioinocular per performance and metal accumulation due to the removal of microorganisms native to soil. And sterilization affect bioinocular performance and metal accumulation due to changes in metal availability. So these screening experiments uh, lead to different performance, lead to overestimation, and are inconsistent uh, with the results that we can have in the field conditions. So we should do these tests in uh, greenhouse sets with contaminated soil and without sterilization, so without spiking the soil as well. Also, what we, we saw that it's maize is a good candidate for phytotechnology solutions, especially for phytostabilization, because there was a higher accumulation in roots than in shoots. 
and this PGPR was uh, beneficial plant growth promoters so we can go through to fill the contaminated sites and test this uh, maize, this variant of maize and this bacteria. And now I'm going to present a field study that we perform for, performed under a project that was a phytosudware project uh, which involved three countries. It was uh, Portugal, Spain and France. And this project was to demonstrate the feasibility of phytotechnology across several types of edaphoclimatic edafo conditions. And uh, uh, we worked specifically in a mine, Buralha mine, here in the northern Portugal. And the Buralha mine was a, a, a mine of tungsten for tungsten production. They, she still, it still has the tailings and ponds exposed to climatary conditions. So they, there is an, uh, wind and uh, aeolic and the water erosion that affects all the surrounding soils. And the, the soil has higher concentration of copper, zinc, cadmium, arsenic and lead. And here is our plots established in, uh, in the area within the, the mine boundaries. And the people here in the vicinity uh, plant their, their, um, the maize, uh, the, the, the lettuce to, 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 to eat. So they, they eat vegetables in grown in soils contaminated with this high concentration of trace elements. So we wanted to test if you can do phyto management in this soil. And we planted sunflower, it chose sunflower and public, poplar because it, the, these plants were suitable for those climate, climatary conditions. And uh, we tested under uh, 700 square meters and uh, poplar and sunflower sun cropping patterns. Uh, uh, poplar was intercropped with a leguminous, which is alfalfa, and they were inoculated with arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi and uh, uh, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Sunflower had also, uh, was also under a cropping pattern, which was uh, winter cropping. So during the winter, we planted clover and alfalfa to enrich the soil with nutrients. And during the summer, we plant sunflower. And we also inoculated the sunflower, part of the sunflower, the other part was the control, with our muscular mycorrhizal fungi and plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. And this trial was under, uh, in the field uh, um, for, uh, in two, for, uh, during two years. And we still are analyzing the, the results, the several parameters, because there were several uh, types of uh, measurements that we had to, uh, to make. Uh, the plant's establishment, the biomass that they achieved, the trace element concentration in the tissues, the trace element availability in the soils, the nutrient content of the plant, the physiological status, the soil enzymes, if there was an improvement of soil enzymes, the soil microbial communities, if there was a change in the microbial communities in these soils under phytomanagement, or there was no change at all. So these things all have to be evaluated to see if the phytomanagement is feasible in a certain area. So here is the sunflowers, some pictures from the beginning of the experiment, here at the end of the experiment. So it was able to establish and grow. So, but what we saw, it's the non-inoculated sunflower had higher biomass than the inoculated ones. And we, we found that the inoculated plants had higher concentration of trace elements. So they were able to phyto extract elements and that's why they have lower biomass. But even though they were able to grow, to have a good biomass and to establish in those higher contaminated sites. We see it uh, through these indicators, the bioconcentration factor and translocation factor that the inoculated plants have higher concentration, fa higher bioconcentration factor, either in root, uh, both in roots and shoots. The trace element bioavailability was also higher in inoculated uh, plots. 
So that's why the plants were able to take up more trace elements for the, their uh, tissues. We also saw that they have a higher content of nitrogen and phosphorus, so the bioinoculation were able to increase the nutrient content of these plants. But other physiological indicator uh, told us that the plants were under stress, the plants inoculated, that's because they had higher concentration of metals. Uh, we still are analyzing the bacteria and fungal diversity. We see that, that, we, that we have some differences in bacteria and fungi, uh, but we still didn't um, uh, gather all the results and make the correct analysis to see what are driving these differences. We also have the bacterial and fungal composition. We see that there are some differences between, between unplanted, inoculated and non-inoculated plots, but we have to figure it out why are these differences and are these differences significant or, or not. And we have a lot of um, data regarding the prokaryotic and fungi diversity. And we have to establish some correlations between also the, the trace element concentration, the bioavailability at the end of the experiment. So there, we, are, we are still working in this data to see if really the phytomanagement works under this precise trace element contaminated soil. The poplar is still under analysis because we, are, we still have the poplar on those sites growing. And uh, now in October, we are collecting this, the final samples to analyze and then to collect all the data and uh, analyze in an integrative manner. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, um, I'm able to answer to all your questions. Thank you, two very interesting and useful presentation. Thank you, dear Helena. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. It's a very good idea for our local research. Thank you. It would be great if we could work with each other. Thank you, Helena. Uh, I consider uh, today's webinar is uh, timely, actually and informative webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>